What up, it's Leeds. Come in from the White Mountains. Shaky connection. Hopefully we're good now. Dart. Interview today with Dart Adams. Appreciate everybody being patient. Yo, yo. Hey. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hold on one second. My headset's a little. How about right. now? There we go. There we go. Now you're moving. Now you're talking. Okay. Are you good? Yeah. All right. Cool. Sorry, man. I'm uh, <laughs> I'm in the White Mountains, and it's uh, I'm struggling to get coverage out here. I, I should have <laughs> tested this beforehand, but uh, we're good now. Cool. Cool. So I just want to welcome everybody to the Leeds Entertainment Podcast. Uh, we were with special guest, journalist, author historian, critic, and a few others, and I'm going to say judge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did a lot of that. Dart, Dart Adams, how we doing, brother? I'm good, man. I'm having an excellent day so far, man. Well, yeah, where are you at right now? This is this is my abode, you know, South End, Lower Roxbury. Nice. You've been there, you grew, you, you grew, you Roxbury your whole life? Yes, uh, I've lived in this neighborhood all pretty much all forty-five point eight three three years of my life. Yeah, man. South End, huh? Yep. What sec? What what section? Are those many different sections of the South End. So the beauty of this part of the South End is that it's next to everything. So when I was a kid, I grew up on the um, the corner of Mass Ave and Columbus, between Mass Columbus and Tremont, and I was at the border of Lower Roxbury. So I was at the border of South End and Lower Roxbury. So quite literally, if you walk down the street that way, you're in Lower Roxbury. If you walk down that way or that way, you're still in the South End. So it was crazy. Like, if you go back that way, that way's the South End. That way, that way, you're in Lower Roxbury. But the thing is that the beauty of being where I was, where I was, is that I was near everything. So you could walk straight to, like, downtown crossing, or you could just walk straight down Mass Ave across the bridge to, Ch to um, Cambridge, or it's an easy shot to Austin and Brighton if you go down, like, um, Commonwealth go down calm ad so yeah. it, it was crazy man i was like near everything yeah Charles River, Boston Harbor, didn't everything. wasn't self in technically all roxbury and then they made it not part roxbury well the thing about south end is that like roxbury existed before the south end did right yeah because this was all marsh and it got filled up they like blew up mountains and shit and hills and everything and they just filled up this entire land and then built on it so, like, the South End was right next to Roxbury, and then they created Lower Roxbury and everything else. But, like, Roxbury existed way before. Roxbury, you know, existed since, like, 1630. And the South End is relatively new. It was created in, like, the 1700s to the 1800s. Nice, nice, nice. So, you've seen Boston go through a lot of different changes over the last, what was it, 46.8 years? Is that what it was? 45.8 <laughs> years, yes. Let's talk, about what it was, let's talk about what it was like growing up there. All right, so uh, the part of the city that I live in now, which is now a tourist area, which is now really clean, which is now highly developed, was dirty, underfunded, and completely neglected. Uh, to give you an idea how neglected it was, I remember as a kid, I told the story to my brother and sister, and they were like, yeah, that's what happened. Um, I remember being a kid, and like our streets weren't painted, uh, everything was neglected, like crosswalks weren't painted over. There were like uh, some potholes. Occasionally they fill them up because we lived on Mass Ave, it's a main street. So it was a huge concern to have like potholes and shit like that. But they would be there and then eventually somebody would come. But I remember one day this team of white folks showed up. They started planting flowers. They started replanting because they used to be these planters in the middle of the streets. They called them islands. Huge ones back in the day. And they put, they potted plants there like new plants, 
they replaced all the street signs, brand new street signs, did all this stuff. And then they came and they started hanging flowers on all the street signs, on all the street signs, like these little flowers. And I'm like, what the hell's going on here? The reason why they did this is because they realized that there was a new pope. And that pope was going to be coming down to Boston and he was going to be in a procession. And a procession is a main street. They use main streets and that being Mass Ave. So they realized this street's going to be on national TV and it's going to be uh, also shown all over the world because that's where the Pope Mobile is going to come down. So that's the only reason they actually showed up to fix my street and my part of town because the goddamn Pope showed up. And then when the Pope left, went right back into disrepair. So the Pope brought the flowers and then the flowers yep. died. And, and they actually painted the crosswalks and everything. You know, it was crazy. And it's not like, like, we have major bus stops. The one goes right through there. So it's like, just the idea that the city did not care. And everything was filthy. Boston was so fucking dirty back then. It's still pretty dirty. Even the nice areas, it's pretty I, dirty. <laughs> where I am, where I am is super touristy. And, yeah. like, if you were to drop something on the street, people would just, like, look at you like, what are you doing? Back in the days, man. I'm, I'm sure it was dirtier. <laughs> oh, I mean... But like I said, big example was like the waterfront. <laughs> that face right there. What's up with the waterfront? Well, if you go to the waterfront now, it's completely touristy. It looks like something out of anime, right? Like yeah. people go there on dates. You know, like oh look how romantic it is. You know, they sit there, they bring out picnics and shit. Like you know, they have like people go there to, like propose. Now, when I was young, you went to the waterfront to do drug deals. <laughs> you went to the waterfront to stab somebody and leave them there. Like, it's a landfill. Yeah, like, it was filthy over there, man. Like, you go down there and you see, like, baby carriages with, like, tires in them. You know, man? Like, nobody went to the waterfront on purpose. Like, you got left there. Now, you know, it's a destination to be, and they fixed it all up. They, they have apartments. They have uh, businesses have moved in there. So the Boston now is a complete departure from the one I grew up in. Yeah, and uh, even and I've been in Boston for 20, 20 years. I just left, and it changed so much in those 20 years. So, I mean, it's constantly changing. It's a, it's a city that's very desirable to a lot of people, and they move there, you know, and that's just the reality of it. You know, it's just become that. So when did hip hop, when did you get involved? Like when did hip hop hit, when did, how old were you when hip hop started hitting you in Boston? Uh, between the ages of three and four. So, three and four? Jeez. Yeah. So, so the, beauty, the beauty of being a Bostonian is that we're near everything. So the five places where hip hop blew up first, you know, of course, is New York, then New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Philly, those five places. That's where hip hop blew up first. That's where the first hip hop shows, the first hip hop radio shows, the tours, everything happened in those five places first. Then, like, you know, you go out to like Chicago, LA, you know, and, and then it fills in from there. But those were the first five places. And this is between 1977 and 1979. So the first rap slash hip hop I heard or saw, the culture I saw, was like as early as I can remember, like 1978. That's like the first time I heard it. But then, like, what did you hear? What was the song you heard? Well, see, that's the thing. It wasn't. There weren't songs. Right. It was like battles, or clashes, or just like recordings of of somebody in a park jam or something like that. That would come from our cousins in New York. They used to send like care packages, and like so. That's the first thing I heard. Or like somebody would show up with a tape from New York, and this would be the new thing. But like in 1979, that's when we started getting them more frequently. And then that's when the first rap records show up. Like um, uh, the first rap record I could remember somebody going to buy. We had two uh, people that lived upstairs from us, family friends. And they had two sons named James and Derek, who were also DJs. Changed my life. Um, and they would go get records. And one of the records was um, King Tim the Third Personality Job by the Fatback Band. And it came out like spring 79. Like, one side was You're My Candy Sweet, other side was um, Personality Job. And that was, like, the first time I had heard rap on record. And then other rap records would come out, but they didn't blow up. But, like, it wasn't until um, Rapper's Delight 
comes out in October 1979, and they play it on WILD, WRBB, uh, all the like Boston radio stations. And that's when people start complaining because they're like, oh, this is about to be the end of rap because now it's on the radio and it's on record. So the first rap record to blow up and cross over is when people thought rap was going like be over. And that was like October 1979. Remember, it was the same time Prince had just dropped his album. So Prince's second album comes out and blows up at the same time Rapper's Delight is on the radio. That's 1979. That's where I was born. I was born now, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so from there how does boston hip-hop scene develop so again being in close proximity to new york what happened was cats would come from new york here or from philly here or from connecticut here and that's where a lot of the cross-pollinization began and also like all a lot of the early rap producers were from boston so you got um who's that Arthur Baker, you have uh, the Johnson crew, so you have Michael Johnson and Maury Starr. So yeah, these Maury guys Starr, were, I knew. Yeah, so these guys were producing for um, Sugar Hill. Johnson crew were producers for in house producers for Sugar Hill for a hot minute before they got fed up with Sylvia and left. Um, they were in house producers for uh, Tommy Boy, uh, Arthur Baker and his boy John Roby, and also Johnson crew were in house producers for. Um, uh, Tommy Boy when they started out, I think in 1981, and like they and then of course Tom, uh, you had uh, Arthur Baker had his own label which was Party Time, and then um, and his other label was uh, Streetwise, right? So he's putting out he's producing for like rap folks and stuff like that for rap producers, and I mean he's producing for rap acts and stuff like that, and so like. A lot of those early 1979, 1980, 1981 rap productions were coming from Boston so we were a lot of the DJs were in the same record pool so it wasn't hard for people to get the records and then the other thing was that there are only five places to go to do shows so Boston our early rap shows are coming here so like that spread everything and like if we talk about like throughout the early 80s you have the Lee School, you have the talent shows, you know, you have your little neighborhood cliques, and, you know, you have your little DJ crews and people battle in school and in the, in the lunchroom and everything else. That was happening all throughout the early 80s. So it spread, but we didn't get, like, and, like, the first, the second rap radio show ever in existence, a lot of people don't know this, was on um, MIT, MIT, before it became the call station as now, was WTBS. Uh, which was bought by um by the guy who now owns like TBS, TNT, and everything else. He bought the call signs from the radio station at MIT for uh, two, I think, lump sums of fifty thousand each. I think, and they had a radio show called The Ghetto, and it was like the second radio show dedicated to rap in the entire country. But nobody really knows about it because, of course, it was at MIT, and it's like a, a college radio station. As opposed to like if it was in New York or Philly where they had Lady B, you know, with the Street Beat show, or New York where they had a plethora of radio shows. So man, Boston always had like a, a, a hip hop scene and rap blew up here. I mean, Bill Adler was living here when he first heard Rappers Delight, you know, and he was writing about like the Boston funk outfits and writing about like Boston R and B and soul acts and, and before. He went to New York and took the job at Def Jam, you know? So it everything came to a head when um Leco's Lemma appears at uh M at MIT in eighty five, eighty six, and then the rats then the entire rap scene really explodes around that. And then you have the Street Beat show, you know, which is named after Lady B show in Philly, when you have um Jonathan Schechter and Dave Go Go Maze and um and at the time, Def Jeff was the DJ from Almighty Artist, so around yep. 87. So, like, that's when everything really blew up. So, so from 87 on, where do you find your role at this point? So, I'm a little kid, um, and the thing is that Boston is the size of Shaq's left shoe. So, everybody knows everybody. <laughs> and if you're in the industry... 
if you make records, if you're an intro circuit, everybody knows who you are. If you have an end to the record industry, everyone knows who you are. So quite literally, everybody who is doing things, so you're talking about Arthur Baker, who had moved to New York, but came back and forth, the Johnson crew, you know, who was on Tommy Boy, and but they're going back and forth to Boston, Philly, uh, New York, you know, wherever they have to go to flying to LA because they're Johnson crew. So they're doing shows. They go, they're going to Germany. They're big in Germany and Italy. Huge. So Prince Charles and City Beat Band, you know, they're big. They're signed, they signed to a major. They're going all around. Um, of course, New Edition, who, you know, uh, we knew because I had family at Orchard Park and also because my cousin was Ralph's best friend uh, growing up. So I was around for all that. And like, all what about different... Uh... What about uh, New Kids on the Block? Were you around for so, that too? So New Kids on the Block, <laughs> New Kids on the Block came a little later, but they started out as a group called Night Nook. But we knew who they were because at the time, um, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but uh, uh, so uh, uh, Homie decided, to, uh, Maury Starr decided to open up a studio, I think it's called Ground Control, right on Wilson Street. Like, right from where I live right now, like, a five-minute walk. So they used to always practice down there at Ground Control. I think it was at 745 Wilson or some shit. So they used to always be around. We used to see them all the time. And then when they performed at Nine Oak, they performed at every, every venue, you know, every school. You know, they're performing with, like, um, uh, like Rusty the Toe Jammer, you know, with Orange Man, you know, with, like, um, uh... Like all the old Boston crews, the fat girls of Boston, um, FTI crew, uh, um, damn, uh, Body Rock crew, which my cousin was originally in with Big Chuck before he joined Almighty RSO when Orange Man left um, and went solo. So, yeah, man, in like 1987, uh, I believe, I believe um, uh, my neighborhood crew, uh, TDS Mob, I think they might have just got started in 1987. They might have just got together. Um, uh, DJ Devastator, Michael K, and um, and at the time, Cool G. Now we know it's Cool Jesus. I think they just got down in 87. Almighty RSO was all over the place. You know, they had already carved their niche. You know, Is Ben Zeno in the group at that time? Well, he was. Oh, uh, Ray Dog was always in the group. So, okay. like, what, when I hear Ben Zeno, I think Ray. You know? So you, always, would you say that, like, Almighty RSO is like one of the biggest first Boston yeah. hip hop groups. You can't tell the story of Boston hip hop without mentioning Almighty RSO. It's impossible. If you try to right. tell the story of Boston hip hop without Almighty RSO, you're it would be like trying to talk tell the story about funk without including James Brown. It's that serious. Like you can't So let's talk about it. let's talk about what how important they were and why back then. Well, they were our face for for one thing. Um Boot Records, Call Us to All, um, We'll Remember You, Greatest Show on Earth, um, We're Notorious. They were the group that, like, everybody knew. If, if Almighty RSO or TDS Mob weren't opening up for somebody, it's like, did they really do a show in Boston? Mm -hmm. You know, like, Almighty RSO were, like, the guys. I remember going into uh, Skippy White's back in the day. Skippy White's used to be on Mass Ave. Right now, it was Cutting Edge Barbershop, 410 Mass Ave. Um, and we used to go there, and on the wall used to be a huge poster of Almighty RSO, you know, for whatever their new single was or whatever. And, like, they were the face of everything. And this is back when it was Almighty RSO. It was um, uh, Schechter had a deal with, uh, um, damn, with Sire Records uh, for BMOC, play that, play that funky music, white boy. Mm -hmm. So he had that deal. So those two posters were on the wall. But Almighty RSO were always the guys. They would travel back and forth to New York. They were the first ones to, like, try to push to get a deal. Uh, they had connections with the source. So that was big. So you would open up the source. Like, the first Boston rap group that you saw with an ad in the source was Almighty RSO. It's in black and white. I actually have it like scanned and everything. It's crazy. So like that face and, and like they were the most prominent group. And you know, they were the ones that put in a lot of work to try to get on 
and, and make their names known. And if somebody did something that wasn't, you know, too, <laughs> that didn't, you know, didn't, uh, yeah, you know, locally, I know. they'd be the I know people to step about. in and regulate. So, yeah, man. Oh, my God. So, so where does, where yeah. does, so where does Ray make Benzino make the jump to get involved with the source? What year? When does that happen? So they were they were always involved with the source because again the Street Beat Show the DJ yeah. is Def Jeff which is Def Jeff on Almighty RSO so RSO were always involved with the source because in the early days of the source when it was like a sheet and printed and stuff like that that you know there were the record stores were I think Spin City um, Nubian Notion and Skippy White you know that like sold the most rap vinyl or what have you. And the guys who would be, you know, had boot records already was, you know, Almighty RSO. So they're actually putting out the vinyl. So if you're going to talk about Boston rap and you're going to be in Boston, you have to be affiliated with the prominent Boston rap group. So, right. I mean, they always were. But when Ray became, like, officially, officially, like, I'm putting my foot down and I'm like involved in the source. It had to do with the mutiny that happened, man. When when Sheck and everybody else left after they did the um the Almighty RSO piece, I believe in 1994, the Boston Big Shots piece. They were like, "All right, this just goes against all journalistic ethics," and that's when like we had the real big first split of the Source Mind Squad. And after that happened, that kind of opened the door for Ray to, like, be more involved in, like, the, the, uh, the operations of the source. But, like, that began in, like, 94, 95. But, like, I feel like it was more between, like, 96 and 98, 99 when it became official, where he stepped into more and more of a role. And after he became Benzino and the Made Men happened in 99, then that kind of expedited the process. So from then on, it was like people looked at the source as like it's owned by, you know, Benzino. Right. As opposed to it's the Bible of hip hop culture and politics, you know? And that's when like the decline started. Yeah. And what a decline. <laughs> when do you become. Like, when do you say, hey, I'm going to be a journalist, and this is what I want to do? When does that happen? So it happened because I realized that I didn't want to rap. Oh, so you were actually rapping? Since, like, 1981. What so your, Were you Dart Adams, or was it a no. different name? What was your name? Oh, my God, this is what you need. I had I have 800 names, but the last Give me the name best I one. had, the last name I had, it was a name called, it was like a Wu-Tang inspired name, Dark Champion, right? Because your rhymes are darts, and I used to always rock champion, so it was Dark Champion. I was Dark like, Champion, dude. I'm going to call but, that now. But then I, when I went online, back in the days when they didn't have the keyword, the keyword um, option, where you could just automatically fill in the passwords back in the days when everybody would go online and everybody would have their own um, message boards. Yep. In order to remember it, I would use the same name, the u username. So the username that was stuck was uh, I could use was Poisonous Dark Seventy Five. So it's Poisonous Dark Seventy Five on everything. When I started answering people's questions about rap, they used to call me Poisonous Dark, and I'm like, God damn it, that's not even my name. So, <laughs> so I had to be Poisonous Dart on everything for the longest. And the problem is that every time I tried to change my name, I forgot that in the UK and London and Europe, darts are huge. So if you try to get a name with something, a dart in it, you have a long list and you can only get certain names, right? Because anything dart related is already taken online. Right. So I, after, um, I used to post on all hip hop. And when I posted on all hip hop, yeah. what I would do is somebody had a thread called school me on some hip hop. I took it over. I just started answering people's questions. This is back in 2005. And yep. then by 2006, I'm on there, and there's this, there's a beef that happens. This is a crazy story. There's a beef that happens between Combat Jack, rest in peace, and this dude Sycamore, who who both post on XXL.com, 
and it was like this big back and forth, back and forth. They do like these disc posts to each other. So I wanted to like bridge the gap. So I did this post on, um, I did this post on all hip hop and I posted it there and everybody kept came on all hip hop and saw it. And August 26th, um, 2006, his next post on XXL.com was mine. So he posted it up and that's what started everything. Because people kept coming to me, it was like, could you write for us? Could you write for us? Could you write for us? And uh, all hip hop was like, could you write a blog for us? But the thing is, XXL didn't have blogs at the time. So they, I would post something and they would sticky it to the site, this part called The Reason. And I did that until January 2007 when I started my own blog, Poisonous Paragraphs. And I changed my name from Poisonous Dark. And I just said, no one's going to pay a guy named Poisonous Dark, plus it's a generic name. So I dropped the poisonous it's dart, and I used my real last name, Adams. So that's when I became Dart Adams, January first, two thousand two thousand seven. And it, so you were, it happened because I was trying to promote my music, and it was—I just felt stupid doing it because I was. People were more receptive to me explaining rap history, and hip hop culture, and sampling, and all these other things than if there was me trying to, a a a a a pop, you know, like. I, I was outside on Boylston Street trying to hand people CDs, you know. So you you pretty much were on the forefront of the blog era. We'll say the blog era. You go from website message boards to starting your own blog in 2007, which is pretty ahead of the time, uh, you know, early. You know, you're probably, I'm guessing you're one of the first to do this at that point. I'm the and third wave. I'm the, the third, third wave. wave. Oh, okay. the first There's wave was ways? early. The early wave was like 2003 to 2005. Second wave was like 2003 to 2006. Third wave was 2007 to 2009. And then after right. that, it was just that's when you get to the Tumblr era, and yeah. it's just a wrap from there, man. But that's important era, though. <laughs> it's a very important era. Yeah. Um, because the this is how people are getting their music heard and seen. It's the number one, uh, the number one way of doing it during that whole, uh, you know, at least towards the the end of the two thousands uh, and and even into the early two thousand tens, it becomes the number one way. Let's talk about that era and how important that was. So the thing about the Tumblr era is that the Tumblr era uh, gave way to the SoundCloud era and the Bandcamp era. The SoundCloud and Bandcamp era is along with Tumblr did something that the blogs didn't realize it would do. It completely usurped them and made them useless. The thing was that blogs ended up becoming, by 2008, 2009, they'd become the tastemakers, they'd become the gatekeepers. So yep. people would send stuff to blogs and then get mad the blog didn't post it because it's holding up their career, it's holding up their advancement, it's holding up their progress in their minds. Because yep. if I could get on uh, Two Dope Boys, if I could get on Nah Right, if I could get on Her Affection, if I could get on um, uh, that blog that Elliot Wilson had that sucked, whatever it was called, um, if you could get on there, that's going to start everything for me, and that's going to like open up doors. And the thing is that what happened was SoundCloud didn't need the blogs to dictate what was dope. Bandcamp didn't need the blog to dictate what was dope. And Tumblr existed in its own universe with its own set of non-rules. So what happened is people had their own culture when it came to Bandcamp, Bandcamp, SoundCloud, and Tumblr. And they would just be on that app. And what happened was the blogs, instead of being the people to dictate what's dope on there, had to react to what was dope on there and post it on their blogs. Yeah. So the power was completely taken away from them. So it shifted in, in one fell swoop and SoundCloud became another universe onto itself and it was beautiful and it was uh, damaging at the same time because when the iPhone and the mobile app for SoundCloud happened all you had to do was go straight to SoundCloud you don't have to go anywhere else so what and I at the time I was running producers I know so I would have to stay abreast of everything that was hot on SoundCloud everything that was hot on Bandcamp and everything that was just being released like straight to like peer-to-peer -peer sites or file sharing sites and folders and then stuff that and the, and the crazy part about um, Bandcamp too is that 
you know, people were releasing albums on Tuesdays and they switched to Fridays, right? So on Bandcamp, you could drop your thing whenever. And also, all you had to do was get an account where you could post that thing on Bandcamp and then release it across all digital platforms if you paid $20 or $25. So what happened was the power completely shifted in that era and people were just dropping their project and building a fan base without having to go through the blogs. And that changed everything. People were doing shows and booking shows off of their self, self-release self project. And oh, yeah. the blogs had to be like, oh, this thing that dropped three days ago was the hottest shit in the world, as opposed to this is going to be the hottest shit in the world. And then three days later, take the credit for it blowing up. When yeah. in that three day span, people can say they're late now. That's what changed yeah. And you know, and there's something that, you know, there's something to be said, like, you know, obviously people don't want to feel like there's a gatekeeper in front of them preventing them from doing anything. But at the same time, there's something to be said about quality, quality control from a, a respected blog with the versus saturation. Because as a consumer, you can't, not everybody can sit through everything to figure out what's good and what's not. You want to, at some point, trust someone's opinion that they know what's up, you yeah. know? So it's I, a tough balance. I was the, a person for about five years that kind of fell into that role that was yeah. like trying to separate the wheat from the chaff and this, 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 and posting on producers I know when, when I had Blogger House. Yeah. Um, like, I would do that. But then, like, after five years, I realized that it's out of my hands, right? right? Because the people and whoever, you know, the people choose and dictate what's the new, what's going to yeah. be the hot shit. And then, you know, there's going to be somebody booking and they're going to be getting the shows and what have you. And it doesn't matter how I feel about certain things. I can champion what I like. I can champion what I love and whatever I have my taste or whatever. But at the end of the day, it's going to be like a drop in the bucket. So... What, so that's one of the things that like I learned from that that era, and then trying to like do some type of quality control, or trying to like, okay, I'll filter out all the everything for you, because that was what a lot of that was what DJ's role was. You sent the music to the DJs, they determine what was hot. You send them the A side, you're like, no, nah, that's not it. The B side is the B side is the thing, you know. Yep. So like that was kind of what I was trying to do. But in the digital age, it was a fucking it was a um. It was a fool's errand, man, because there was so much to get through. Like, if you yeah. want to go on um, producersiknow.com and just scroll and just scroll through those years, like 2010, 2011, 2012, 2014, 2015, you're like, Jesus Christ, do you sleep? And the answer was, no, I didn't. And I was abreast of everything, but at the end... You know, yeah, I was around, I was around, and I could tell people that, like, Ketra, Ketra, Ketra Nada, back when he was Ketra Domus, is going to be the next big thing, right? But the people decided that, not really me, so it's not like I could take yeah. credit for that. He was going to do what he was going to do regardless, you know? Oh. I was around for the early days of Danny Brown, me and FWMJ. FWMJ is the guy who actually put on J Electronica. So I heard J Electronica back in 2005, 2006 through my boy Frank, FWMJ. Producers I know is the sister side of rappers I know. And, like, I was around for all these early things that blew up. But the fact of the matter is that, yeah, we can take credit for some of that stuff. But it was going to do what it was going to do regardless. Because, you know, I feel like what, we, what those people had, or what those artists had was undeniable. So at the end of the day, like, I could, I, I would felt, feel like, yes, I'm doing quality troll. Yes, I'm doing... Uh, uh, service for the people, but w when when the smoke cleared, I was like, I don't want to take credit for shit that would have popped off regardless, because people yeah. get big heads and think they're more than they are when that happens. No, I feel you. It was kind of the same way in booking shows. You know, you know, there were shows that I booked that were going to be successful whether I did it or not, and you know, I had to humble myself too and, and be like, you know, this isn't because of me. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I'm just. I'm the guy with the email with the connection to the club and I'm facilitating it. And I, and I liked, I took a, I took a big honor in facilitating that, but 
it wasn't really <laughs> my extra expertise that was the reason this was a success and the show was popping. Yeah. yeah, but going to a lot of the shows that you threw, I got to see a lot of people grow exponentially, like yeah. in real time. Action Bronson, remember yeah. his first couple of shows, and then like that was a slow, that was a slow burn. That was yep, his quick. first couple of shows, and then like coming back, and like the entire downstairs is packed, and I'm like, what? the fuck just happened. I'll never forget the Action Bronson and um, it was the Action Bronson show and um, what's his name? Big Crit. The Action Bronson and Big Crit yeah. show. Oh yeah. my yeah. God. Yeah. And that, and was that, that was a good one. What was and, that? But that was his third, uh, hold on. One, two, three. That was his fourth Boston play at that point. Yes. So yeah. it wasn't even like... Uh, like again, that wasn't a fast blow up. That was that took time. You know, the very first time. time he came to Boston, he came with Dante Ross, and I was supposed to meet them, yep. and I ended up being late, and Dante Ross left. So I did meet them that night. That was at church, right? Yes, yep. it was at church. So I, I got a funny story for you. Oh, I hung out with them afterwards, and uh, we went out and we recorded a verse for Right Hook. We did a joint for Right Hook, and uh, we ate. <clears throat> we, he wanted to get some foods. We ate Chinese food. <laughs> So we were in Chinatown. My studio was at South Station, and we were in Chinatown. So it's me, Action Bronson, and Dante Ross, a few others. In Chinese food, they order so much Chinese food. I mean, this is just like a buffet worth of Chinese food. And they just keep bringing it and bringing it and bringing it. And everyone's eating it and eating it. But somewhere along the line, Dante realized he had had too much. And they tried to bring one more item. And he goes, we did not order that. And flips out, flips out on the lady. And we're all just sitting there like, Okay, <laughs> it was the most awkward, awkward thing ever. But uh, eating all this Chinese food with Action Bronson and Dante Ross was quite the experience. Because the thing is, Dante was a switch. One minute he'd be like Zen, calm, and the next minute he'd be like, <clears throat> like in your face. He was had that type of rage to him, and he was working on it. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I could relate to that type of mentality. But that was that. Was, but that was that night. And from there, I built a relationship with those guys. They came back, action came back, performed with Slain, co-headline co with Slain, and then yeah. did his own show, and then did the crit one. And then from there, it's yeah. touring with Danny Brown at the Wilbur, to headlining a sold-out show, House of Blues. And now he's uh, working out a lot on television. Yeah. <laughs> I go so, on yeah. IG, and I'm like, is he trying to enter the world strongman competition? My goodness. <laughs> like, like, what are you, really? Like, it, it, he looks like he's training for the Avengers, man. I'm just like, Jesus Christ. Well, to be honest, it's good for him because, yeah. you know, Brady was going, you know, yeah. but, you know, his health would have caught up with him. Yeah. But anyways, you know, I will say, let's all talk about the blog era and SoundCloud era did to journalism because journalism, I'm not, we're talking journalism, writing a story yeah. versus yeah. the new single that's out right now. Here's a quick blurb because mm -hmm. I feel like there's a big difference between those two yet real journalism got affected by the blog era and these short blurb things that writers and people that were trying to go in this career suffered because of this. Is that correct to say? Long form writing in general, especially about right. music, went to shit <laughs> right after um, everybody started getting 24-7 internet, right? So this is between 2002 and 2004, because it took a while for everybody to get it. So okay. here in 2002 is like when we started getting um, cable modems and, you know, people started getting DSL. And that changed everything when you could be online 24-7. Because the only people that could be online 24-7 before that is if you had a T1 line at a work site or if you were in a college or a university. And so back in the days, I'm talking like 99, 2000, what people used to do was they used to have these things called land parties. And the people who worked there and cleaned in these offices, especially like the theater district, Chinatown, the financial district, they used to um, have people come in <laughs> and have secret LAN parties where they would play games online, yeah. you know, and charge money and then clean up everything and everybody go, right? And then they started doing it with different um, places, like uh, right around the time the dot-com bubble burst, right? When the dot-com bubble burst, a lot of people is, and a lot of
the people who were in the dot com game, you know, had to go back home and live with their parents after telling them that, you know what I'm saying, I don't need to do that. I own a company, you know, and it, it, it has this valuation and shit. And they had to move back in with their parents and all they had was a skateboard, you know, and, and used to stop. But it was uh, along that time when everybody's uh, going back and doing office jobs and everybody's losing their jobs at box stores, <laughs> everybody's losing their jobs at box stores, uh, what happens is people start writing online on web blogs. So they're doing long form writing on web blogs because they don't see it anymore really in magazines because when the internet took over, what it did was it changed the immediacy and it changed the, the space between the artist and the music, right? Because this is the era of leaks too. Yep. When you would just go into Google, write the artist, the name of the album, and then RAR or zip right after it, yep. and it would pop up because right. they didn't have, um, they didn't have uh, security like that, like they do now, right? So it was the days of leak math. You knew if the album's coming out on the 24th, by between the 17th and the 19th, it will have hit the internet. So all you got to do is just search it. And then you would go on um, all the different uh, message boards, and you would, there were times you had allowances. Like if you've been on there for a while, you had this many posts, you had special yeah. allowances, and you could go to subspaces on there. And that's where everybody would have the new mixtape or the new album. And so everything was pirated. So people were listening to the album. Before, back in the days, you would go, read a magazine, the vibe, the source, what have you, and it would tell you about the album before it came out. Right. And that would give you the idea of whether or not or their review if you want to buy it. You already heard it. So you would be playing the album in your head, in your iPod, or whatever your handheld device is, or on your laptop through um, um, iTunes, and you're reading the review. Gotcha. That completely fucked everything up, right? Because... Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Before that, before everybody had twenty four seven internet, I used to work at a place. Um, I used to work at a place called Mailboxes, etc., which was across the street from me. And yep. the old mailbox was um belonged to the Fever magazine. If anybody remembers the Fever magazine? It was like Boston's answer to the source after they left. There was a dude Gadget who ran it, and so they used to keep sending promos to the Fever box, even though the Fever wasn't in existence anymore. Because all the labels just sent promos of the fever. And the guy who ran the box was like, you can have anything that comes in there. So I'm getting all the promos. I'm getting all the early stuff. But then when the internet happens, I'm already hearing stuff. At the same time, I'm getting the early promos that the that I'm supposed to get. And that's when it really hit me that that was going to compromise writing and journalism. And then like Twitter did it further because Everybody's tweeting about the leaked album before any journalist can even write about it, you know, because journalists are supposed to sit down and analyze and write it. But the public has already spoken about the album before you even have a chance to uh, write about it or the thing that happened. And so real time social media is also what completely altered journalism forever because journalism had to become a completely different animal in order to keep up with real-time social media. Because, again, we're not getting the album a month in advance. It's not like what happened with yeah. Illmatic. People were sitting with Illmatic and, and ready to die for three months before anybody else heard it. Then right. Those days are dead. Like, the only reason I hear album, I had, I only way I got to hear an album before it was released and everybody else is because I was involved in the making of it. Right. So it's crazy. It's crazy to see how that happened. No, I, yeah, that, that's good. But that makes sense, though. That, that, you know, piracy <laughs> killed killed the game. <laughs> you know, one of one of the one of the articles that you wrote, I wanted you just to speculate on one of the the ones that that I didn't know this is actually <laughs> that you read an article that says that fight the power saved public enemy, yeah, and nearly destroyed do the right thing. Now, my only question is. Takes a Nation is, is out before the album. Takes a Nation is yeah. out before that song. Yeah. I've, you're telling me that Public Enemies is struggling at that point and that no. Fight the Power saves them? No, 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 no. No, they weren't struggling. They were going to disband. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the group chemistry yeah. is, yeah. is, they're about yeah. to break up. Yeah. The group was going to disband. Ah. Uh, uh, people wanted, people like, cancel culture times 50 happened to Public Enemy. 
in 1988-1989. And that's why I outlined everything that happened to them in the article. Um, and they were about to break up. They were about to leave Def Jam. They were about to go on their, in their separate routes, go solo, what have you. And when you talk about cancel culture, you talk about the Griff incident? Yes. The Griff okay. incident. So the Griff incident and the fallout from the Griff incident is really what so, so did. So Professor Griff, where he makes the anti-Semitic comments, yes. apparently, and everyone's like, the heck with public enemy. It's an anti-Semitic yes. group, basically. Yes. But also, the thing is that him making those remarks and then uh, Chuck D going back and forth about whether he's in the group, he's out of the group, he's in the group, yeah. he's out of the group, angers people more. And then the right. other part is that you have to remember that Def Jam has several prominent Jewish guys right there <laughs> taking the heat alongside public enemy so it's doing damage to the label it's doing damage to the people who who are at, up at the, the top you know reaches of the label and yeah. it's horrible horrible pr and on top of that they have a hugely successful album that's international right and they had another album that was supposed to be coming out that was on hold so fight the power what Fight the Power does is it's supposed to be Public Enemy Swan Song. And it ends up being the thing that brings them back. It does the Don't. opposite. So, right. and then, then you know, uh, what happens is we have uh, um, uh, Yusef Hawkins is murdered yep. in Bensonhurst. And yep, I know that story. Public Enemy is back. They're reinstated. They're back. Everywhere back. And then they put out uh, an amazing album. Uh, fear of a black planet, so yep. to put the punctuation on it, but yeah, and man. the movie, and then yeah, but let's talk, let's talk about the movie. How it, you says it almost is it because of public enemy's controversy, it almost yes. destroys do the right thing, yeah, as well? because you gotta remember, man, do the right thing, fight the power is all throughout do the right thing, right? Fight the power was pretty much the promotional vehicle for the film because a lot of people don't realize this, man, like there's like June thirtieth, nineteen eighty nine. Fight the uh, do the right thing comes out. No, it, it was in it was in limited release, limited release. That means it was only showing in select theaters, right? No, I mean Spike Lee wasn't what the, wasn't the household name yet at that point. He was getting there. Right? He was getting there, but yeah, you know, he, but this he was the a, one that put him on the map. Yeah, exactly. This is the film that put him over the top. Yeah. So so um. It's in limited theaters. So Public Enemy's controversy can pretty much keep this film from spreading into wide release. It didn't. It actually bolstered the film. It actually brought more people to see it. It did really well in limited release. Then it went in a wide release and did even better. So the controversy actually um, helped people or, or opened more people's eyes to the film and they went to see it. They were like, they came out like, this film was amazing. However, when he went to con with it, they were like, we don't know what the fuck this is. However, Sally Field saw it and said, this film is a tour de force. This is amazing. Y'all are tripping. This Sally is one of the Field. best. But Sally Field. This is one of the best films I've ever seen. And she went to back for Spike Lee in that film. And everybody else on the panel was just like, uh, flying nun, Gidget, you, you crazy. Um, but it ends up becoming, you know, a classic. And, you know, it's now known as the film that put Spike Lee over the top. And it's also the film that has its own documentary, which is amazing. And it's the film that brought back, and it's the song that brought back Public Enemy. And it's one of the all-time great rap summer songs. People talk about summertime. I'm always going to bring up Fight the Power, although people are going to get mad and be like, you can't play Fight the Power to cook out. I don't care. You can. You actually, yeah. actually I can do whatever I want. Yeah. The other one, the other article you wrote, which I think is very important era, is you talk about Rockus relaunching a new era of hip hop, and I'm on, I'm all for this theory because I think it saves hip hop in a lot of ways. In, in that, in what ninety eight, ninety nine, um, let's talk about that era. So, for me, uh, everything starts in ninety seven. Yeah, because what happens is. Uh, late T-Rex, the album comes out on Soul Sides, later known as Quantum. That drops. Yep. Um, on July 22nd, 1997, two albums come out that are polarizing. 
Puff Daddy and the Family No Way Out, which everybody's going to the record store to buy. And then there's me who went to the record store looking for Fun Crusher Plus by Company Flow. And I have to tell you, couldn't find that shit almost anywhere. Uh, cassette was costing $15 if you could find it. Uh, the CD, oh, Jesus Christ. The CD was like eighteen eighty nine. It was not on sale. People didn't yeah. know what the hell it was. Um, but I ended up buying Fun Crusher Plus on CD. I remember I brought it back home, played it. Me and my brother played it. And we're listening to it. And we're like, what the fuck is this? Last Good Sleep, Blind, Eight Steps to Perfection. Like, Fire. you know, Loon TNS, The Fire in Which You Burn. Like, oh, my God. Now, then there's another album that comes out on the label called, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Rhyme Sayers. In, in 1997, and it's called Overcast by Atmosphere, right? So those three albums start everything for the underground. Those three albums start everything. And then later on, another compilation comes out called um, Sound Bombing, which takes people a while to catch on to. Can right? I make one point that I like to throw in there? I also like to throw in New York Reality Check, yes, DJ Premier absolutely. mixtape. Absolutely, that one too. Right there too, because I feel like that also puts that out there, yeah. along with sound bombing and yeah. all that you're talking about as well. Yeah. So that came out like at the end of the year. So that's like 98, early 98. Well, it came out late 97, but people didn't catch Maybe it right. until early 98. So it was messed up Fair because enough. sound bombing, that, and some other, and like I think um, uh, The Lesson Volume 1 by Stretch Armstrong, they yep. took a while for people to catch on to. And like when volume and lesson two comes out, people like are buying it more. So sound bombing two changed everything because a lot of people never bought sound bombing. Right? I did. And the promotion yeah, I did. The promotion for sound bombing two and the fact that like the uh the and one mixtapes came out, volume one, and they had songs from sound bombing two on there, and they had videos. And you found a full color orange ad in the source and ego trip and mass appeal and 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 uh what else was out at the time? Um XXL, you know, whatever magazine was out. So, like, what, what do you think about also the Lyricist Lounge compilation as well in ninety eight too? That plays a big role as well. Too. Yeah. I think like the Lyricist Lounge compilation was big mainly because like the singles. But it's funny because when you talk to people at the time, they're like, they thought it was uneven. I loved it. It was two CDs. It had like all the packaging and everything else. Like, I, I loved that. But I think that like, that was raucous when they had huge major distribution and also yeah. big money backing them as an independent and were able to really make a foothold and enter like the billboard charts as opposed to just CMJ monthly or weekly, you know? Right. You know, just get played on like college radio. They were entering the national rotation on yeah. like Hot 97 with with joints on rockets, and that was where they were super important, right? Right. Because we're gonna take Shabam Sadiq. <laughs> you know, no. we're gonna take uh, Sir Menelik, aka Cyclops 4000. We're gonna take like uh, uh, Ra, R.A. the Rugged Man. And we're going to put them everywhere At because Agua. we have company flow. You know, it's just crazy to think that like you could go into like the mall. You'd be in the mall and you'd hear like company flow playing, or like Eminem's Any Man. You know, because Rockus had that kind of reach. So that's why that was important. And then and you end up with the Lyricist Lounge show on MTV, and you know yeah. it kind of changes everything. And you also see the birth of Talib Kweli, most deaf, the, the reinsurgence yeah. of Farrell Monch's solo career. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot that comes out of that at that era. And it paves the way for, in my opinion, underground hip hop, like the, the term underground hip hop, which is yeah. a huge backbone in Boston, <laughs> the Boston hip hop scene, yeah. as far as my career goes, yeah. from when it starts in the late 90s until I, it's still going, in my opinion. Yeah. Boston was a backpack rap mecca, largely because yep. it's a college, college. It's a college town, but also because there's so much there's so much quality college radio. You had 88.9 at night, 
uh, back in the days, you had WRBB's Rap Explosion Show. You had um, you had MIT. You had WHRB. You know, you had so much. You had so many different college stations. And then the fact was that you had all these different venues to kind of cater to the scene, and they were like concentrated in Cambridge. You know, you had you know Middle East, Western Front. You know, later on there was also Bill's Bar at the time. I believe it was in Austin, Brighton, maybe. And you know, Old Down Lands Down. Me and Stacks Left used to talk about Old Down Lands Down, where you could have these places. There was spots like Playhouse. You know, uh, so it was. Like, everywhere you went, you went to downtown Frosting, you went to the corner mall, there will be people in ciphers just outside, you know. Uh, you would just go to, like, different corners. Oh, you would hang out around Berkeley College of Music, where you had the EU Wurlitzer, Daddy's Junkie Music. Um, yep. You had, uh, you had, uh, uh, you had uh, uh, Looney Tunes, you had Nuggets, yep. you had Mystery Train. Uh, you had all these different record stores all around, and everybody used to meet. I used to hide records from Edan and Fax One on my lunch break. Or Biscuit Head? Off, yeah. yeah. Biscuit Head? <laughs> yeah. Directly across the street from where I worked at Tower Records. I used, okay. and, and I used to go to Biscuit Head, and everybody would be, meet up because people would be riding on the elevator, you know, on the way out the uh, Biscuit Head. And then they'd be shopping at Biscuit Head, talking shit to DJ Bruno and Master Millions. And that's where, like, uh, I, I met, you know, uh, Mr. Jason and Nabo Rock and a whole bunch of other people. And then they would come across the street to Tower Records and we would hang out, you know. So, like, that was the explosion of a whole scene, you know. Everybody was <laughs> buying beer from the same place. Everybody was getting records from the same place. Everybody was going to the same venues. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's an era of diehards. I always say Boston is just like diehards. Like, you know what I mean? I'm a diehard. You're a diehard. We have tons of friends who are diehards. Yeah. <laughs> All I know is diehards. You yeah, know like, what I mean? <laughs> UGHH, uh, yep. starting out from a dorm room, Quest dorm room in 1997 on, on, at Northeastern. Like, yeah, yeah, man. It's great. So I got to ask you, man, you know, uh, your brain, <laughs> how does it store all this information? I mean, is it do you have, is it like an obsessive thing, or is, can you shut it off? <laughs> no, you can't shut it off. That's Let's so. Talk about that. Has it always been like that? Uh, it You've just got, been a sponge your whole life. Yeah. So, um, I can pretty much remember almost everything. I think my maybe eighty five percent of what happened when I started reading at age two and a half, and I was born August nineteen seventy five. So you do the math and figure out when that begins. So like 1978 on, I kind of remember it. I can remember where I was when I heard a song on the radio. I don't remember dates, I have to go backwards, right? I know kind of what time of year and I know what else was happening. And then I have to go look it up and be like, all right, so this happened October 1979. This happened September 1978. Uh, I can remember like full days of <coughs> kindergarten one and two. And I think I started wow. in the Boston Public School 78, 79, 79, 80, right? So, I remember full days of school. So like the first school I went to was the Prince School, which is it's 201 Newberry Street. It's now uh, condos. But I can walk around that place and tell you where the uh, where we used to play uh, kickball, uh, where the lobby was, where the where the two kindergarten classes were, where they used to have the hallway, where the lunchroom was. If I was to walk around that place, because I remember it like that. So it took me years to be able to figure out how to manage remembering everything even if you don't want to and it's funny because some stuff comes back like i'll just be doing something and all of a sudden a memory from 1981 comes back and i remember it like yesterday but it's a lot to keep to, to deal with in your head when you remember 1984 like you remember 2014 like that's a lot to deal with right yeah so, so, and like, so most people sleep, I say maybe six, eight hours. I sleep like four hours tops because my brain is overclocked. But when I do sleep, like I get right back up. And also I don't dream anymore really because his is crazy. Anybody could tell you that one of the big parts of dreaming is rapid eye movement and everything else and falling into sleep and like having these things that happen while you're asleep when you dream. I can't read, you can't read during dreams. 
So my brain, if I even start trying to have a, a dream and it's like, okay, I'm living my actual life and I go to read something and I can't read it, my brain's like, nope, this is a dream. So when I go to sleep, it's black and I just wake up four hours later. So I don't dream anymore because I can't read and do what I normally do in my real life in my dreams. So, Does only getting four hours of sleep affect you? I mean, that's got to affect you physically. No, um, if I don't sleep at all. So um, four hours of sleep. So here's the thing. And for me to get eight uh, more hours of sleep, I would have to be super tired. Or the only other time it happens is like, well, I'm at home, right? And I have my routine. If I'm traveling and I can't do anything that's normally in my power, I'll sleep. Like I sleep, I sleep on planes because I can't do shit else. I'm not at home. You know, I can't do research. I can't go to where I normally go. I can't do what I normally do. So my brain's just like, well, fuck it. Let's just kill some time. Go to sleep. You know? So it's there you funny. Go. I'm not, I'm never Forced tired. Forced into sleep. <laughs> yeah. But if I have something to do, I'm not going to stay up because, you know, I feel responsibility and I don't want to be at, 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 um, at lower than my peak efficiency. And also that's the thing, that's what makes me sleep because yeah. if I go for more than 36 hours without sleep, that starts to affect my brain function and, and my um, efficiency and I, I can't have that. Yeah. Let's talk about the book you wrote, The Best Damn Hip Hop Writing. Yeah. <laughs> what is that? As a collection of essays? What, what, what was it? So what happened with that was my publisher, decided um, he wanted to do an anthology book of a bunch of like my collection, my collected writings. So I ah. sent in a bunch of the more recent stuff that I did. Um, I had, a, I had a, 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 a column that I did for Mass Appeal before it stopped doing any content whatsoever called Knowledge Darks. Yep. And so I had pretty much that entire run, some other stuff I did for OK Player and some other stuff that I did and minimal stuff that I did for my blogs because, you know, it wasn't really 100% fact checked. It didn't have an editor and stuff like that. Plus, I feel like the best work I did was more recent when I was, like, more efficient and stuff like that. So what happened was they do the book. It comes back. And I'm like, I get an email or a text. And it's like, oh, your book's going live. I'm like, what? I thought it was going to go live. I was told between August and September. So I'm telling people, though, my book's coming out. My book's coming out. My book's coming out. Week passes, my book doesn't come out. Month passes, my book doesn't come out. So then when it does come out, <laughs> he's, I get hit up. It's like, yo, your book's live. But, you know, we want to announce it on Friday or whatever. So I just tell my immediate family because they're, they're thinking they're like, you got taken. Somebody said your book's coming out. It's not coming out. So I tell my immediate family, I'm like, yo, my book's coming out. Here's the link or whatever. Just my immediate family. They get on Facebook, which I don't use, and they tell everybody. And so it spreads from my immediate family to my circle of friends on Facebook. Then it makes its way over to Twitter. And what ends up happening is the book sells out of my, three straight micro orders, and then it sells out of another order. And then, after, and then it gets to the point where after the fifth uh, order sells out, it's on back order for a month. So I didn't see my book until uh, my boy Sean of Four Boston Now the Label. He got a copy early when it first went live on um, Amazon. So I ran to the North End, which is like a 30 minute run, and I read my book for the first time. And that's when I realized what was in it. So that's, that's what happened with my book process. And I was like, well, my next book, the next process, I want to have more, you know, I actually like to, you know, have an idea of what the cover is and, you know, what's going to be in it and stuff like that. Because as much as I, as much as I like the book and how people, how people received it and stuff like that, it wasn't really my vision for what I wanted the book to be, you know, yeah. but it is the rollout, the rollout was a little shaky. <laughs> a little. <No>. Yeah. <laughs> So it's what now, thing. man? So what now in this era, post-COVID, music business is all shaken up. Mm -hmm. Like, so, you know, what what are you doing now? Uh, so what happened is I got into doing um, fact-checking and um, 
I got into fact checking and I got into um, contributing to other people's books. And because it started, I remember I was on Twitter writing about something and I get a DM and it's a woman from the Hassan Minhaj show. And she's like, um, we're doing an episode about political hip hop and the history of it. And would you like to like help us out with research? And I was like, absolutely. I was like, that's like, yeah, that's, that's what I do. So we're going back and forth. I'm going back and forth with the producer. I send her all these materials of stuff to read, essays that I've done. And then she asks me questions. I go back and forth with her. So the episode comes out. She was like, well, based on the information you gave us and everything else and how things were going, we kind of diverged. But we used a lot of your like research, what have you. But thanks for the help. And what happened was from there, more people started coming to me and asking me for help and stuff like that. Because six years ago, I mean, five years ago, I did a piece uh, grief, airing my grievances about um, the get down and the inaccuracies and all the issues with the get down. So that was one of the biggest articles that actually blew up on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And I'm not on Facebook to give you an idea how big that got. <laughs> and I think Nelson George kind of pissed off at me for a while, but he, it, it, I don't know. I, I need to talk to him because I have issues with him about his, about his finding the funk and him not having Boston in it. So it is what Ooh. it is, what it is. But what ended up happening was people would do books, films, television, and they would hit me up. And they'd be like, yo, when did this album come out? When did this single drop? And then I started getting referred more to now when people do books, they'll actually hit me up. And then they're like, I just did this entire manuscript. Could you fact check it for me? I'm like, cool. So I've done that like five, six, seven times or what have you. And then I started getting the eyes of more people. And people were like, could you read my book and tell me how you feel about it? I go through it. I'd be like, all right, these two things are wrong. So then I get referred to more people. So now I, you know, I'm still actually writing books. I'm in the process of doing a book right now that I can't talk about uh, too much until like this, the next announcement is made. But um, it's going to be out April 2022. Uh, but I actually, I'm doing a whole bunch of other stuff on the side that I signed NDA, like NDAs and stuff. But I'm doing like a, a lot of work in like fact checking, writing, researching. I've oh. done pieces for uh, Boston Magazine, uh, Bost, uh, uh, Boston uh, Globe Magazine. I actually work with um, Janae Osterheld, who's a culture writer at the Boston Globe on uh, Beautiful Resistance, uh, her series, which actually got nominated for a, a, a New England Emmy. Um, they just had the New England Emmy Awards recently. We didn't win, but it's just amazing to be nominated. Yeah, people say that and actually mean it. I just did. Um, uh, I just contributed to this. Uh oh, the we Wild Sam Field Guide to Boston, which is going to be released in early July. This just came in the mail for me today. I contributed to it, so nice. that that's a big thing. Um, I contributed to a. Oh, uh, actually. Oh. Kendrick Lamar called Promise That You Will Sing About Me. It comes out on my 46th birthday, which is August 17th, 2021. That's the book. This is a pre, this is, we're in the future. It's not out yet, August 17th. But so. to that book um, that's coming out. Uh, I fact checked this book by, uh, New York Times best-selling author uh, Hanif Abdul-Rakib called A Little Devil in America, uh, Notes and Praise of Black Performance. This book was a task, a short to fact check, but it's an amazing written, it's an amazing book. It covers the entire history of America. And my God, man, I, I put to the ringer. And the big thing that's coming out, October 5th, 2021, um, I fact check uh, New York Times bestselling author uh, Shea Serrano's book, Hip Hop and Other Things. And that, that was fun to do. Like, that, <laughs> that was an enjoyable experience, man. Because when you're a hip hop nerd, people typically ask you stuff about break beats and samples and records and who was the first, who's the first MC to do this. Shea would hit me up and be like, uh, can you name as many songs as you can where people made animal noises in the, on the record? <laughs> you know, uh, 
uh, could you name me a bunch of songs where people make fun of other people's mothers? You know, like shit like that. So I got to understand why when I was trying to pitch hip hop and R and B and soul books to like um to like uh, companies and like uh and like book people and people in publishing, how come they weren't so receptive? But when you read Shay's writing, you understand why he's a bestseller and why like a lot of like rat nerd nerdery and like a lot of minutia, it just doesn't do well in that space. Because people would tell me, man, it's like, look, the only people who would read that book are you, Questlove, <laughs> Just Blaze, um, Alchemist, you know, uh, fucking Jake One, Meyer Hawthorne, you know, like people who make the music. Like, I'm the same person who yells at the screen every verses because they don't do a verses with like Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis versus like Full Force. But the thing is that there's a reason why they do these things they do for a wider audience. And it took a long time for me to realize that like my niche is being somebody who like, who, who's like a fact checker and knows all this information, you know, I kind of, it took me a while to figure out what my niche was. So. Well, I think you found it right there. And, uh, anybody else <laughs> users, uh, commenters, tweeters, beware. Dart Adams is going to fact check your stuff. <laughs> yeah, and people get like the one that happened recently was you know, everybody saying that June 28th, uh, 1988 is the release date of It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold This Back uh -oh. and um, Long Live the Cane. And those albums came out four days apart. One album was released June 24th, 1988. The other album was released June 28th, 1988. That's the reason why they debut on the Billboard charts a week after each other. And I'm like, you can't do a basic fucking fact check to figure that out. And it was funny because I remember Chuck D wrote the wrong release date for his album. I was like, nah, Chuck, the album came out on the 24th. And, and the thing is that Chuck, don't, Chuck doesn't know because I'll tell you something. For like their first three albums, they were on tour. They were on tour when the albums came out. They had no idea when the album came out. Like dead yeah. ass. They were on tour while um, their, albums were, their albums were out. That's insane. You know, that's nuts. Public Enemy were always on tour. So he never knew. Still he, are. He put out. Still he are. put out. He put out a whole book with dates in it, and about thirty-three percent of those dates are wrong. Fun. Like fun. I said, Dart Adams is on your trail, so everybody beware. But hey, hey, man, I gotta run. I gotta wrap this up. We got a storm coming out here. But uh, Dart, thank you for joining us, man. I really appreciate you giving us your time, man. I look forward to uh, reading or seeing what you're a part of in the future, man. I know uh, it's, it's, it's important. You're a very important person to uh, the Boston music scene, you know? So people keep telling me. You are. <laughs> so uh, I just want to thank everybody for uh, tuning in to the Leeds Edutainment podcast with special guest, author, A&R, historian, judge, contributor, <laughs> fact checker, yeah. Dart Adams. So thank you, brother. Thank you, man. Talk soon. All right, one. All right.